In this video, I want to talk a little bit more about the neurological diagnostic method, but I'm still going to stay pretty light on the details. We'll save a lot more details for later videos. Diagnosing which disorder is causing a neurological syndrome can be difficult because there are hundreds, if not thousands, of syndromes, different neurological syndromes. And recall that a syndrome is a collection of symptoms and signs from dysfunction in part of the nervous system. So let me just write syndrome 1, syndrome 2, and syndrome 3 here to represent some different syndromes. For example, like weakness on one side of the body could be syndrome 1, or abnormal language and speaking could be syndrome 2, or loss of part of the vision could be syndrome 3. And there are hundreds if not thousands of these possible neurological syndromes, depending on how narrowly or broadly they are defined. But then there are also hundreds if not thousands of neurological disorders. So actual diseases or types of pathologies that can cause dysfunction in parts of the nervous system. So let me just write disorders A, B, and C to represent some different disorders that could affect the nervous system. For example, let's say A is bleeding into the brain, and B is a metabolic problem affecting all the nerves, and C is some kind of tumor that's compressing the spinal cord. So there are lots of neurological syndromes, and there are lots of neurological disorders. But to make matters even worse, many neurological syndromes can be caused by more than one neurological disorder. So whatever syndrome one is over here, perhaps it could be caused by any of these three neurological disorders. So that just by knowing that syndrome, you still have a list of possible disorders that could be causing that one syndrome. And it turns out the opposite is also true. Many neurological disorders can actually cause multiple syndromes. So that we could say that disorder A here could actually cause syndromes 1, 2, or 3. That you could get different syndromes from the same disorder. So this sheer number of possibilities trying to connect neurological syndromes to the disorder that's causing them can make this a daunting task trying to make the diagnosis of which disorder is causing the syndrome that your patient has. So the way I approach it, and the way I think most neurologists approach this, is to break the diagnostic process down into a few steps. For me, and I would encourage for everyone, step number one is to locate the lesion. Where is the problem in the nervous system that's causing the neurological syndrome? And that usually just takes two pieces of information. What are the symptoms? And what are the signs, the abnormalities found on examination? And the first part of this step is to actually ask, is the problem in the nervous system? Because sometimes what looks like a neurological syndrome is actually a problem with another of the body's systems and not a problem of the nervous system itself. But if you think the problem is in the nervous system, the next part of this I ask is, is the problem in the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord, the central nervous system, or is the problem in the peripheral nervous system, somewhere in all the nerves outside of the central nervous system going out into the periphery? Or is there a problem of both? Is there dysfunction in both the central nervous system and in the peripheral nervous system? And the reason I start with this step, locating the lesion first, is that disorders tend to affect either the central nervous system or the peripheral nervous system or both. And by figuring this out first, you often whittle down the list of possibilities from hundreds of or thousands of neurological disorders to a much smaller number that affect the parts of the nervous system that you think are involved. Now, unfortunately, there are some neurological syndromes where we're actually not sure where the problem is. Many of these, we think, involve a dysfunction somewhere in the brain, but some disorders we're not even sure if the problem is in the brain or another part of the nervous system. So for these syndromes, one actually has to learn some pattern recognition and can't use this kind of stepwise process to help narrow down the list of possible disorders that are involved. Step two for me is to further narrow the list of possible diagnoses by factoring in the syndrome time course. Time course, or some people will use the term tempo for the syndrome time course. And this is the temporal pattern or the timing of the symptoms and signs of the syndrome at onset and during the subsequent course of the syndrome after it gets started. The time course of the start and the start we call onset, so I'll just write that, the onset of the syndrome, turns out to be particularly important. So let me put a little star next to that. 
So the speed of the onset often gives you a lot of information about what type of pathology, what types of disorders could be causing the syndrome that you're looking at. Because some types of pathology tend to create a syndrome that develops very rapidly, whereas others tend to develop much more slowly. There are a lot of different terms people use to try to describe the time course of a syndrome. Unfortunately, the terms aren't used consistently, so there's often some confusion when people are using the terms in a little different way. For the onset speed, some terms that are commonly used include the term acute, or sometimes people will say sudden, to mean that a syndrome is developing rapidly. Often people will use this for a syndrome that develops over seconds to hours. The next term that's used commonly is called subacute, subacute, which is slower than acute, but not the slowest. And often people will use this for a syndrome that develops over days to weeks. Lastly is the term chronic, or some people use the term gradual. And often this term will be used for syndromes that develop over weeks to years or even decades. There are a lot of other terms that are used after a syndrome has started for the subsequent course. And I won't write them down. I'll go into detail about them later. But terms that can be used for subsequent course include continuous or episodic, if the syndrome is there all the time or if it's coming or going, fluctuating or static, for a syndrome that's not going away but is changing or is not changing at all, and resolving or progressive for something that's getting better or something that's getting worse over time. Step number three for me, step number three, is now to factor in what are called risk factors. Risk factors. And risk factors are anything specific about an individual patient that puts them at risk for certain specific disorders. And patient risk factors for neurological disorders may include things like their age, their sex, if they're male or female, and many other possible pieces of information found in a number of different areas of what we call the patient's history. This could include things in their past medical history, for instance, if they've had a heart attack in the past, or what we call the social history, such as if the patient smokes cigarettes, or in the family history, if a certain disorder has run in the family and is genetic, and even things like what medications a patient takes or if they have certain allergies. So when I go through this three-step process, by first narrowing down the types of pathology that may be involved by figuring out where the lesion location is in the nervous system, and then further narrowing down that list by factoring in the time course, then sometimes the patient's risk factors will really zero me in on a few specific disorders that are most likely for an individual patient. Now, when I go through these steps, I end up with a list. Usually it's a list. Usually I don't get down to just one, but I get down to a few disorders that are most likely, and then we rank them by probability. So we might say that the most likely disorder causing the syndrome is disorder A, and the second most likely is disorder B, and the third most likely is disorder C, and that everything else is pretty unlikely. These would be the most likely ones. And this list of likely disorders ranked by probability is called the differential diagnosis. Differential, differential diagnosis. It's the differential diagnosis list. And the differential diagnosis really guides everything that happens next, including the strategy for ordering tests or administering treatments, if any are necessary. And this strategy, this approach, is really the same as for every other system of the body, for disorders of any system in the body. But for neurological syndromes, this step one, this kind of locating the lesion step, tends to be much more involved because of the size and the complexity of the nervous system. Sometimes skipping steps or doing them in a different order can work out just fine for certain situations. But I find that it often increases the risk of making the wrong diagnosis particularly skipping step one, trying to figure out where the problem is in the nervous system, or starting with the patient's risk factors. I find that those changes in particular can increase the risk of ending up with the wrong diagnosis.